welcome to today's conversation on the house as a laboratory for capital, finance, housing, and territory. I'm going to give a brief introduction. It will be in English, but the rest of the event will be in Spanish with, with simultaneous interpretation into English, which is available through the Zoom interpretation feature. So if you need interpretation from Spanish to English, you click on the globe icon to the right of the chat icon, a menu will appear and you can select the audio channel for English to hear the translated audio. If you don't need interpretation, you can ignore this instruction. Okay. Um, and if you're having any trouble, uh, please let us know through chat. We are very grateful that you are all here with us, even if we can't see you. It is in some sense random that we are holding this event today on April 30th with some of the leading activists of the feminist movement in Argentina, as well as other colleagues from Brazil to talk about, among other things, dispossession, violence, and gender. It was a day when we were all available, but perhaps it is not random and is instead the power from below that secretly weaves its alliances. I say this because 44 years ago today, on April 30th, 1976, a small group of women arrived at the Argentine government building in Buenos Aires to deliver a letter demanding to know the whereabouts of their children who had disappeared. This group of women soon became known as the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, las madres de Plaza de Mayo. So perhaps April 30th is not random, but a clear sign that struggles have histories and genealogies, that the problems we will discuss today are in effect linked to the dictatorship years and rule, and that the two April 30ths illuminate each other, revealing what is not always immediately visible. In celebration and honor of the path that the Madres de Plaza de Mayo forged 44 years ago and continue to, we remember them always as we aspire to live up to their activist legacy. I'm Natalia Brizuela, a professor at UC Berkeley, and with my colleague and friend Samir Esmir, I'm the co-PI of the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs. Today's event is part of a series of conversations with artists, activists, and scholars that we have been hosting throughout the year on the consortium's four research themes for the duration of our project. Themes that we believe will engage some of the pressing issues of our times. The environment, ecological politics, and the multiplicity of forms of life, political defeat and practices of persistence, collective and personal debt and care, and fourth, camps, borders, and the ethics and politics of hospitality. Our hope is that by exploring and connecting forms of knowledge that are rooted in historically changing realities of devastation, destruction, geopolitical inequality, and exploitation, our engagement with these themes throughout the workshops and conversations such as today's will connect creative, critical, and open-ended vocabularies in order to articulate through a grounded and situated approach, pathways for creating a different present and future. Today's conversation will offer, I believe, a political cartography through one of the most urgent global crises of our time, housing. The International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs is generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Berkeley. And we thank them for their commitment and support of the consortium and its projects. I want to thank the members of the consortium team, which are here with us today, even though they're not visible to most of you out there in the audience. Um, as well as the members of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research for all the work they have done to set up and help run today's event. In particular, I want to thank Brianna George, Miranda Schoenburn, Patricia Dunlap, and Tim Wyman McCarthy for all their work and generosity. 
Today's conversation about housing, urban space, debt, extraction of value, and social reproduction will offer ways of accounting for new forms of exploitation, expropriation, and dispossession through a feminist framework. Our speakers in their roles as scholars and activists will address today's right to housing through their investigations and interventions in Argentina and Brazil. Today's conversation was convened by Lucy Caballero with Veronica Gago, research affiliates of the consortium. And it is the continuation of an incubator workshop they ran and convened in August of 2020. There's some incredible materials from this ongoing research on our website that I invite you to spend some time with. And I think there's gonna be a link on the chat. Um, and I want to, you know, before we start, just really thank Lucy Caballero and Veronica Gago for their incredible work as feminist activists and scholars, always giving body and ground to the abstractions of the political and economic systems that attempt to engulf everything and for agreeing to lead us in this research. I will introduce our guest speakers um, in the order in which they will speak, and then we will plunge into conversations and there will be plenty of time for questions with all of you out there in the audience. I thank you so much for being here. I also want to thank our interpreters, um, Isidra and Marcy, who are here with us, and to remind everyone also myself to speak slowly. We get excited and we go quickly and we forget that there it is an incredibly difficult task and a tiring task to be interpreting. So we, we, will, we will try, Marcy and Isidra, thank you. And we will try to, to, be, to speak slowly. Okay, so Lucy Caballero, is a sociologist and researcher at the Universidad de Buenos Aires and a member of the feminist collective Ni Una Menos. She teaches gender studies at the Universidad 3 de Febrero and the Universidad de Buenos Aires. Her research focuses on feminist economies, in particular debt and gender. She is the co-author with Veronica Gago of Una Lectura Feminista de la Deuda, which has been translated into Portuguese, Italian, and most recently English, but maybe other languages. And I apologize if there's other languages I'm forgetting. After Lucy, we'll hear from Veronica Gago, who teaches political science at the Universidad de Buenos Aires and is professor of sociology at the Instituto de Altos Estudios at the Universidad Nacional de San Martín. She is the author of La Razón Neoliberal, Economías Barrocas y Pragmática Popular which has been translated into numerous languages, among them Portuguese, French, and English, and co-author of Una Lectura Feminista de la Deuda with Lucy Caballero, and most recently of La Potencia Feminista o El Deseo de Cambiarlo Todo, which has been translated into Portuguese, French, English, and I know there's a number of other translations forthcoming. She's a member of the radical collective Press Tinta Limon and was part of the militant research experience Colectivo Situaciones and is now a member of Ni Una Menos. Raquel Rolnik is a professor, architect, and urban planner with over 35 years of scholarship, activism, and practical experience in planning, urban land policy, and housing issues. Based in Sao Paulo, she's the chair of the Department of Design and Planning at the School of Architecture and Urbanism at the Universidad de Sao Paulo. Rolnik is the author of numerous books, including Guerra dos Lugares, La Colonización da Terra e da Moragia na Era das Finanças, which has been translated into English and Spanish, A Cidade e a Lei, and Sao Paulo, Historia, Conflito e Territorio. She has held various government positions, including director of the planning department of the city of Sao Paulo and the national secretary for urban programs of the Brazilian Ministry of Cities between 2003 and 2007. Since 2019, she has organized a research action lab called Lab Cidade. And there's gonna be a link for that too, posted on the chat so you can find out more about Lab Cidade which includes as one of its main projects, an observatory on evictions in the larger metropolitan area of Sao Paulo. And there's also a link coming up for, for the, that observatory. Uh, Raquel will, will share her presentation with Isadora Guerreiro, 
who is a professor at the School of Architecture and Urbanism at the Universidad de Sao Paulo as well, and is also a researcher at La Cidade. Then we will hear lastly from Paula Freire Santos, who's a Brazilian architect and urbanist based in Sao Paulo. She's a prof professor of urban planning at the School of Architecture and Urbanism at the Universidad de Sao Paulo and with Raquel Rolnik coordinates research at Lab Cidade. And we're also very thrilled to have uh, Larissa Lacerda, who's also a member of Lab Cidade, here with us today um, in this conversation uh, that we will have after the presentations. So welcome everyone. Thank everyone for being here. And I am passing the, the word to Lucy Caballero, and we are now switching to Spanish. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, well, thank you very much. I'm going to start with a thank yous, first of all. Uh, and, and slowly, please. Uh, I first want to thank all the people who work in the consortium, Natalia, Brianna, uh, to the interpreters, uh, Samera who has uh, been with us and who has encouraged us to continue researching and they have inspired us to do these crosses that Natalia was talking about. And in second place, I want to thank very heartfelt thanks to our uh, colleagues from Brazil with whom we're going to be uh, uh, trying to deepen this uh, cross in our research they are, have also inspired us to try and systematize what could be a line of research that is entitled the house as a laboratory of capital as if thank you very much to them for being here and also for sharing their research and activities in the first place i would like to start by by discussing the title, Why the House as a Laboratory of Capital, which is the title that we chose with my colleagues for this workshop. Veronica and I are not precisely students or researchers of the urban planning. That's, we don't do urban sociology. We were not focused at least in these problems or issues of uh, housing. But one of the first questions that we had is, why are we crossing and needing this? Um, or why does this need of thinking about the question of a space and the production or the, and the urban production appears in our studies, in our uh, feminist and gender studies? And also, why? this cross appears in our research, which was uh, mostly focused on uh, private debt and domestic debt, and how that intersects with the feminist uh, perspective. So I think there is a very important milestone, which is to think about why this need appears to create this intersection, uh, what it means, the situation uh, that happened during the pandemic from the feminist perspective, or at least in Argentina, because I under, but I understand that this is really a global vocabulary, the uh, feminist movement has demanded conditions to stay home so that you can actually can do this requirement of caring for yourself, which is associated with the domestic space. But at the same time, time we have been questioning what does it mean to stay in this domestic space? Why is feminism that has politicized this domestic space, this speciality in general, but is specifically the domestic space as a place where there is oppression, exploitation, where there could be violence? And uh, my first uh, point is that, that uh, there is a demand uh, from governments to stay at home. And in some ways, it has been criticized uh, from a double perspective uh, by feminists. For uh, on the one hand, 
uh, demanding certain material conditions to stay in that space. And secondly, to criticize that space uh, as a space of exploitation and gender oppression. In that sense, uh, in the in the pandemic crisis, we find an increase of uh, macho violence and simultaneously a an, um, housing crisis. And this is a very important point to think uh, how the situation has uh, developed. Uh, the, now that we have a housing crisis, the violence has increased. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, that these dynamics are appearing or become center in this pedagogy of feminism, which is to amplify what the relation is between uh, men violence and um, financial pressure. And in second place, we have tried to research in the pandemic um, Ha, the, the domestic space as a, as a place to be researched because this um, housing crisis also has meant the increase and in apparitions of new debts. For example, debts linked to rents, which has become a, a, a first step towards eviction. And but there's also been debts towards public services as well as other debts that contribute to um, sustaining this space, this domestic space, um, and, and needing to be uh, caring for yourself at that space. So staying at home to take care of yourself has meant that new debts have appeared. So in that sense, we have also identified that in the space domestic during the pandemic, on top of these new debts, there is an increase of work that is not being paid. And in this sense, the domestic space is a space with uh, that it has gender mandates, as the feminism has uh, pointed out for many years. So we have been researching, for example, like domestic debt is really united with those uh, gender mandates. The finances have captured and taken advantage of these gender mandates, which mean that they uh, take it for granted that women and feminized bodies are going to accept uh, multiplying their work in order to pay for that debt. So we have talked about the pandemic becoming a new production of domesticity associated to debt and associated to the increase of the reproductive work and we have talked about a debt that is immobilized. So the people who have been able to stay at their homes, um, for them, this pandemic that in some, in a sense, could be like a generalized subversion, we have actually thought about it uh, as what is it that has been suspended or stopped in time and what is intensified. And what we have noticed is that the, uh, the, the suspension of certain activities has signified the intensification of financial pressure. So we have also said that the pandemic can be thought from the perspective of which movements produce debt and which immobilities produce uh, rents or vice versa. And that's where uh, the uh, key role of the intensification and exploitation of the uh, housing speculation uh, has appeared. In that point, we have started to talk about uh, ownership violence. In, on the one hand, there's been a violence that has been exerted from the owners and the, uh, the, the the, the com companies that uh, own, the pro own the properties, which uh, and have accumulated that debt both formally and informally, and that has been translated into a uh, capacity to threaten and bribe this population. But we also have talked about violence that is an ownership violence to make it evident that uh, the possibility to have or not have housing has meant in the pandemic a limit or a boundary for the uh, machista violence. The housing space 
uh, has uh, taken an, a central role as an intensifier of the gender inequalities. And uh, last point that we should think about is about this uh, intersection uh, in, the, in the feminist studies and the studies about debt and the studies about housing is that this crisis in housing uh, has signified as well going back so like uh, kind of go backwards in the family is who owns or doesn't own the property has meant going back into more family forms or familistas. This is a point that we need to uh, think about when we talk about the dynamic about property. Um, we need to think about it in conjunction with an uh, sexual and gender order. So this is also important when we think about the intersection of feminist studies with, for example, uh, urban sociology and what my colleagues are going to talk about afterwards. I want to stop here so that we can think about this uh, this point as a point of provocation and why we are using this term so much in the studies about financing and feminism, especially in terms of the housing issue, which is in the center of the debates and the feminist agendas. I'm going to finish here and Veronica is going to come up. So I'm going to retake and I'm going to widen this definition of this workshop. I also want to thank all of you, all of you who make possible this meeting. It's a workshop, a talking workshop uh, that in uh, of a uh, elaboration in uh, as it's of uh, investigation program. It's not just uh, a, a fi finalized conference. It's a moment of sharing uh, while we're doing an investigation line, a collective process, a collaborative process of investigation. In that way, uh, the image that we've uh, selected for this workshop that says speculation uh, imaginary uh, speculation of the territories or how to put the territories in a place of uh, speculation. It has the purpose of uh, to dispute the, the word uh, speculation uh, in terms of the financial or the real estate uh, allusions to the world. To retake this word uh, speculation in terms of speculation speculation how do the territories especially the feminisms have made territories and every territory especially those that are in crisis spatial spaces of working collectively spaces to think to imagine how do we want to analyze to live and in that way i think we're concluding like lucy was saying our investigations our ways of doing activism at the same time in the ways and the theories on the streets at home um, in that way this question of how do you convert how do you change uh, territories uh, as spaces of uh, having problems or issues um, and in general lines uh, in our investigation how have we been rethinking and reconceptualizing the the social reproduction of the majority in our p countries is uh, uh, more and more penetrated by uh, finance, finances. How does, how does finance have come into everyday life and how this has become a, a fundamental vector of uh, part of the go government of the neoliberal and that uh, becomes a question collective, uh, a collective question. How does the debt as a, how does it extract uh, value in uh, completely heterogeneous areas of work? Um, this for us, the debt has become uh, exactly 
in a device that's uh, ambivalent in terms of uh, uh, managing um, things that are precarious. It makes uh, the promise, the human promise uh, to work towards capital, uh, the privacy, it has privatized the crisis of reproduction, the crisis to eat, to safeguard yourself, to heal yourself. And it's, uh, and it articulates uh, in terms with uh, mandates of gender, uh, mandates that we've been talking about in, uh, in, revel in rebellion. And so we see that the debt takes uh, value from reproductive values. It explodes, ex it exploits, sorry. Um, and it shows that value is produced there. And at the same time, it extracts value. And I'm talking about ambivalence because it ratifies the production of value in that space. And at the same time, it takes it over. It, it makes uh, things precarious, precarious generally. And, and in that way, the, the domestic debt, once, once it's achieved, uh, getting mixed into the everyday life, it becomes an index of the indebtedness uh, towards uh, international debt. Uh, and in that way, the uh, feminist per perspective of the debt, it gives us a, a way to look at things in both a macro and a micro uh, view. Uh, from the feminist analysis is to politicize this territory of uh, social reproduction, confront directly finances in terms of a device that uh, comes from the government uh, and these mandates of gender and this exploitation of work. And this investigation has uh, is one of the axles that's allowed our reading to think and to rethink what are we talking about when we talk about the domestic space? How does respect to space, which is the most closed and the most intimate space, has been penetrated by technolo technology, the most abstract technology, and this uh, superimposition of closed space, confined space, and at the same time, the intrusion of technology, of financial technology, is an important point to take apart the st stereotypes and what is a, 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 this uh, domestic confinement? And is it mobile and, and immobile, closed and open or crossed by these technologies? And this uh, second point that I wanted to make is an image that we're working with and that has to do with uh, the uh, idea, the bigger idea of the house as a laboratory of capital is the, the home as a factory. It's an it's a image that we've begun to work that starting from the pandemic, from the investigation, how does uh, new forms of work have come into the home? There's an exploitation of domestic work. How on in the home, a uh, series of uh, demands have uh, befallen that have to do with the crisis, the housing crisis and the, uh, the food crisis. Uh, so the home as a factory, it's a space, it's a, a part of the, the fem feminist uh, were talking during the 1970s about the home being a space as productive space. There's a super imposition of those, the house and the factory, this, in this intensification of both of the domestic uh, space as a home and, and factory is one that we want to have a discussion about. Uh, we want to, this third point that I want to talk about is to widen the idea of a uh, domestic territory. Um, when we're talking about uh, the popular economies, the migrant, the women's economies, thinking about the domestic, not just home confinement and closed within the house, but also the widening or the um, um, falling, uh, the, the widening of the presence of the home in uh, the other structures that guarantee the reproduction of life uh, that cannot be uh, just confined to a house. The, so there are double ways, double uh, directions. The, the um, concentration on the inside of the home 
there's no uh, social reproduction possible if it's only within the house. We need these networks, these community networks, these neighborhood networks that they guarantee to be the front line in the moments of crisis. And this makes us think, what are the spaces the, that the feminisms have been arguing for and that giving value to? These are the spaces where the uh, the, uh, the mandates of gender are being disputed body to body that uh, it, to demystify these, these spaces. And so to finish, I wanted to simply add that these, these planes of analysis for us need to be opened up in a discussion that has to do with uh, pr property. That's why we talk about violence in property. Uh, in the analysis in the eco economic uh, feminism, uh, this distribution of property, and not just pro not just the property of bodies, which uh, we've classically discussed within feminism, but also the property of land, of patents, of food, of of homes. Is it's a point that allows to, uh, the widening of the debate. And also, lastly, how to think about strategies to uh, lose the debt, to get rid of the debt. Uh, how do we think about debt and space in terms of getting rid of the debt and reappropriating uh, as two vectors of the political practice? I also leave this. Uh, my time is coming up, and I'm passing uh, the mic to my colleagues. Uh, OK, so now we're going now. And we want to also begin thanking the entire team uh, to the colleagues and the possibility of sharing what now are really in our hypotheses of, of work, hypotheses of work and our challenges, uh, our research challenges. Um, as Lucy said and Veronica said, we have done a little uh, uh, a path that's a inverse from the political uh, urban poli uh, policy from the, that analysis from the housing and the urban towards the feminism toward a conversation or discussion starting from there uh, from a context that's very wide. And so I link it to what Veronica uh, said about uh, the passing on of the debt from the countries towards the families, towards the individuals and women, as uh, how we see the role of housing in this context. And so Isadora will start there with our hypotheses, and then I'll continue, and then Paula. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. I want to thank you for the invitation to share our work here with you. Our hypotheses about the new world uh, context for neoliberalism, where we're observing a an agenda of flexibilization of the Okay. looking to expand the market, um, uh, linked to global finances, uh, in, in contrast to a first period during the 90s, where the neoliberalism in Latin America was in privatizations, a public, uh, we are now seeing a new wave uh, where there's a a relationship of links that are maintained over time, a ongoing flow of uh, public uh, sector resources towards the private sector. And this is accompanied by the mechanisms, by institutional mechanisms to transfer resources from the public sector to the private sector. So this uh, flexibilization of that relationship uh, 
begins in the labor laws, but then extends uh, to all the rights, to all the social rights, including housing. And so the logic of the expansion of the uh, financial markets is based on the insecurity of the uh, contractual relationships that are private and, and the logic of the business or the or the uh, uh, entrepreneur, the self. So it takes the relation, the responsibility away from the states in terms of uh, the rights. In the working world, we see the expansion of uh, the uberization. I did not get that last word. Uh, that can also be related to housing. This has to uberization. Oh, I think she's saying uberization is a contractual uh, form that concentrates the flows of uh, income from a, a bunch of different uh, uh, private contracts that are precarious and temporal. And then um, that you transfer the, uh, the responsibility to the provider of services to the worker uh, in that way contracts, private contracts are made fragmented, are atomized and, and de-articulated. In this logic of the entrepreneur or, or the... Uh, they've been able to avoid the law and at the same time, there's a great concentration of accords, of agreements between the consumers and then uh, service providers that can be managed by the um, financial system by an intermediary that controls that controls the standardization of uh, the service of providing services and the control of the work and uh, uh, housing as a service and not as property. And so we see that the uberization of work is parallel to that housing in the same way of uh, gathering the um, um, income as rent. The contract is temporary. It's uh, linked to the uh, giving of services. There's a separation between using and property. There's a flexibility uh, between the production and the space with uh, a, a more control over time. The key to this transformation are the di digital platforms that allow the management of this cloud of providers and the uh, placement of finances because they're intermediaries uh, within their technological intermediaries that divide part of the flows of these relationships to the uh, financial systems. These uh, digital platforms are companies that um, uh, are in, involved in the stock market or want to be involved in the stock market. In the case of the housing, uh, no, Vivienda, yes. The objective is to have uh, the programs, uh, the rent programs, such as vouchers, that are based in the same logic of the ongoing flow of re resources to uh, be, make it become a dispersion of uh, private contracts. In Brazil, the rent is happening in an informal way in Brazil, in the precar in the risky areas, in the areas. Uh, the articulation of these programs uh, within uh, digital platforms that can make a connections between un informal housing and the finances through political uh, public policy. These are our objectives for uh, investigation. And I'll give the mic to Raquel. So we're talking about a, a pass-through. We could speak about the indebtedness, the the role of in of indebtedness with central uh, uh, in the previous cycle from a point of view from a popular territory, the uh, debt would be a kind of product from the operations of restructurization um, and and the imposition of different uh, ways of uh, 
uh, the new the new uh, sets the new uh, the new sets of housing that people have to pay for every month to live at. Uh, so passing the debt from the state to the family and submitting uh, people to their logics. Now there's a new phase in place. It's not just, it's no longer necessary the operation of uh, taking territory away, but the reproduction of the process of self-production or self-management uh, uh, of uh, housing with the possibility of being colonized by finance in a way, a new way of, pen to, of penetrating finances within the territory of those who are the most poor, the poorest. They have a, a very little money, but there are very many of them. So there's a possibility there of a great profit and great uh, rentability, uh, great income uh, making. And for this operation, this is going to strengthen the practices, the extractivist practices uh, that are already present in the territory. For example, uh, it strengthens the role of managers, of local managers, many times, uh, sometimes criminal, uh, that articulate uh, uh, illegalities with the formality. So uh, a management that's uh, in the limits uh, a private regimens of uh, territorial control uh, in extractivist model. In terms of the milicias in Rio de Janeiro, it's absolutely clear that it's an articulation of a part of the state, that especially that part that is the police military part of the state with uh, service providers and markets with the use in even with uh, violence of a liaison that is uh, discretionary, that very many times it's uh, uh, the, the law holds uh, able. The territory and, and drug, uh, these uh, illicit markets, these spaces that are historically this am ambiguous territory, formal, illegal, formal, informal, illegal, legal, it can exist, it can not exist. This opens the space uh, to penetrate these markets between the legal and illegal. Um, and also, it opens the space to this political, this discretionary policy of the state. So today, the, the deepening between these connections includes the production and the exploration of the constructed space, of housing between these fronts that articulate the illicit markets and the parts of the states, especially uh, the pol police, the security, the political and the um, party centric, and the possibility to extract through rent, especially around rent. Rent is a key question. So rent can be part of uh, deepening of home as a marketing, a political marketing uh, through its uh, ex, uh, temporary access, it's managed by private regimens, um, local private regimens that segment and that uh, uh, base itself on the insecurity and the transience of uh, the renting that are submitted the majority of the homes in the sectors of low income. And so we're talking about uh, in between two circuits, two types of exploitation circuits, uh, the exploitation of the rent and the indebtedness, one that's done through the digital platforms that manage a uh, stock that's constructed constructed from housing, in, even informal housing, and from another part in this regimen to control territory, privately, with security, militarized, uh, chauvin um, chauvinistic, and uh, taking over the popular territory. And that's what we are going to continue with. <laughs> I think now I start. I think it's, it's my turn now. I'm going to make an introduction 
or better said, I'm going to use a presentation. You can see her, see it in the in Zoom. I'm going to speak in Portuñal, Portuñol, like a mix of Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, I chose to write some of the things in Spanish so that you can understand. I'm going to start by showing. Oh, no. Um, there we are. Now we have the full, the full screen of the presentation. Everything that I'm going to show today is part of a research of La Cidad, and is an opportunity for us to debate and share our initiatives. And I organized with Larissa Lacerlac, who is uh, here in the Zoom. I hope you can see her. Uh, it, it's a job or it's a project that we already started, so it's already on its way. And we started with these people that you can see here, Marina, Giselle, Isabella. We started from a project about being displaced and we understand displacement as a process of threat and eviction where the urban trajectory, they don't have any more space in the diagram of family work and their own house. They are uh, intersected by projects of housing insecurity and permanent transience that marks their lives and territories. And we wanna have a new understanding of a diagram of intelligibility uh, going from the displacement as a point of anchoring. So we looked at evictions as a dispossession and restructuring of life. So we are not looking only at uh, eviction as something that, that, that uh, an object that has been dispossessed like the house, but also as a potential a locus for transformation. And that's why I put a photo. This is a woman fighting during a process of eviction and she broke her nose. So violence is, is uh, violence is part of this process, especially against women. So we want to give visibility, not only about the process of evictions, but also about who are the people evicted from a point of view that is placed on thinking of eviction as uh, from the point of view of the experience of threatened women and evicted women, and as an event from which it is possible to see processes of resistance and alliances. This is another image of this process. And we thought theoretically I don't know if you can see it on the screen. We were based on the idea of emplacement displacement. So it's a processes of displacement that mean destruction of the housing, uh, labor uh, precariousness, and ending to the social security, and also debt that uh, fall upon part of the population. And that at the same time, this population that is evicted means to uh, be displaced. And that produces other processes of emplacement and they have to reconstruct their networks, their relations. It's a little bit what Veronica was talking about, the amplified house and the communal networks. So they have to be repositioned in a new territory. So we're always taking this double, uh, the do this double issue of emplacement and displacement. So many years ago, Ra Rachel started this, or Raquel started this, which is an observatory of evictions. The observatory vis visualized the processes with a little points on a map, uh, or, and, and the, the uh, challenge was to know who were those people that were being evicted. 
So we, we started to think about a territorial onboarding, really go into the territories and see who was being evicted and observe from up close those lines of life, those trajectories that are designing a territory of constant eviction in space. This is, for example, a map of the uh, Zona Norte or, or North Zone in Sao Paulo. So we looked at those maps to think about a, a, a displacement as a, from an intersectional point of view, because gender and racial raciality are very important in Brazil. We come from a country where the feminist, uh, the black feminist thought the idea of intersectionality imposes a point of view based on gender. And in Brazil, their uh, racial thinking is uh, something that you cannot avoid. But how can you do that? Patricia Hill Collins says, uh, well, she criticizes the ways in which this concept has been used in academia because they were only looking at cold data women are here, men are in that other place. Oftentimes these analyses are binary, men, women, black, white, but we cannot just talk about data and theoretical models that can uh, reproduce hierarchies. We, uh, we read the work by Desmond, for example, who does evictions uh, separating social groups, but without establishing a dialogue with the movements, the black movements, without talking about the processes of forming new territories. So we understand that the challenge of intersectionality has a, a potential that is epistemological and political, and that we needed to have a collective effort. And we needed to go from a, a situational point of view. So we experimented in different languages. And here you can see the result of these, um, of these issues, which is an article that you're seeing here. And uh, you can see how the researchers were really on the field, examining from above, from below. And they had a, a much different perspectives that, that were more um, activists, more theoretical. So we continued orga organizing and constructing this essay with fragments of uh, conversations collected in the fields and the territories that we are visiting and working on, but also uh, making like a um, collage of ethnographic uh, stories, uh, etc. So we uh, we went from three historical processes. That was our point of departure. One of them is a colonial uh, rooting, and uh, you can see fragments of our conversations here on the sidebar in orange. Uh, and we organized th uh, these uh, thoughts on three axes. One is uh, understanding the process of dispossession as a structural process with a colonial road that is uh, reproduced even today, for example, through debt. Uh, also, the second axe is the is, is slavery by debt. In the colonia, black women in Sao Paulo had debts that consumed their whole lives in order to obtain freedom for their children. Nowadays, women are not owners, uh, and even less black women. So we cannot only look at the machista point of view, but also need to look at the racial point of view to explain the proprietary violence in Brazil. And so we talk a lot about this um, racialism that is based on debt. We use a lot uh, Da Silva and also Ver Veronica Gago when we studied these processes of dispossession. And they have a lot to do with what Isadora presented about uberization and also with debt. So it's, yeah, yes. We are entering into a financial or financialization role that is much bigger than the actual market. And then we are talking about the day-to-day uh, -day violence 
that are um, situational or uh, slow or that are uh, related to ownership or violence that is ethic. And these violences are looking at processes of evictions as processes that are violent and slow, which don't occur only at the time of eviction, but also during the time of free organization in the processes of threat. And also even more tense during the pandemic uh, where the family of this place is a possible structure to inhabit and imposes the moralization, the, the paper of gender, as well as relationships with debt that uh, is what we say in, in Portuguese, uh, leave from favor. You, you can stay in the house just for a little bit. And uh, at some point, the family is gonna have to pay that moral debt in one way or another. We also have a, a eviction or displacement related to domestic violence because many women suffer domestic violence and they need to figure out where they're gonna live. So this is the second act. And the third one is like looking at those spaces as a space of cracks, of dispute and of resistance. It's also a process of resistance and transformation here you can see the photo of an uh, occupied house by women. So they could talk about uh, gender violence. And, uh, and here you can see images from resistance as well as resistances and assemblies organization in these spaces. And here I'm gonna close with a sentence from a, a meeting at assemb a communal, communal assembly that says that a woman said that it's, it's not worth for nothing that the municipality says, you are gonna make it and you will have a better house. So what do we wanna do now? We wanna continue these individual trajectories by women. And in the last slide, I put some of my hypotheses see how they are related with new forms of colonialism. So uh, like they maintain the subjugation that is colonial and racial. And also they are related not only to the destruction of housing, but also to the labor force being precarious and you know this, the destruction of social security and uh, uh, also the process of threat that one leaves and uh, the reorganization of the structure of reproduction of life during the displacement or eviction. Um, uh, I'm sorry if I went a little bit over time. Gracias. Paula, Thank you, Paula. Raquel, were you going to say something else? Thank you, everybody. These have been great presentations. I think that uh, you're going to have a lot of questions to ask each other and also many comments to debate. But I wanted perhaps where Paula ended so we can ask uh, Lucy Ibero because it's something that had stayed in me as an echo or as a question, which was related to the end of the presentation that Veronica just did. She talked about the question of thinking about the strategies of ending debt and reappropriating territory and space. I wanted to hear what you had to say. And uh, not only as theorists, but also as activists. What would be some of the strategies for ending debt and reappropriating territories that you're seeing that is actually happening or that you are imagining that could happen? Because I thought, yes, of course, one of the things that you can do or that you've been doing in the process 
uh, and also through the organization Nuna Menos is that a dispute about terms and you've done that as well when talking about debt from 2017 on so like for example rephrasing the debt is with us um, so one could say these strategies of disputing terms re-signifying them one could imagine that is symbolic because it's, uh, it's words but in fact the words that you uh, dispute or that you talk about is actually something that has a body and that appears in the body of the city itself and of the women. So it's not just only about a symbolic struggle about words. It's about the words and the things are still connecting. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about these strategies that you're thinking about or that you're seeing beyond the dispute of terms. Yes. For us, the idea of thinking precisely ways to do the uh, financial um, dis disobedience was always central. One of the first keys, because it's all these processes that we're talking about, uh, for example, what Vera was talking about was the advancement of uh, debt above social reproduction is a it's a financial colonization, and it's a process that appears not as a theoretical operation, but in the sense that one can um, confront it and illuminate it, we can see clearly that it appears during the pandemic, very clearly, the accumulation of debt for rent. These are processes that one, we saw this process very clearly, not as something to theorize about, but something that was a political problem. We had to question very clearly what it means to accumulate debt in a situation of sanitary crisis in order to be able to sustain prevention, prevention in the domestic space. This showed up as a political uh, problem, and I think this is the first level of confrontation about finances over reproduction and social reproduction, which is talk about the, the advance of financialization over all areas of life. I think what Vera said about the demand for ending debt is really very important in Argentina, especially from the movements and the unions of uh, tenants unions, which is uh, to return that debt that one has accumulated during the pandemic as see it as an illegitimate debt because it was accumulated in a moment where the majority of the population had a work problems and they couldn't really get incomes. So we should turn this uh, debt uh, as uh, something that is illegitimate. And in this strategy, uh, it is very linked how to think about the end of debt with the production of other spaces. We say that we need to multiply the forms of thinking about the strategies of the end of debt because they go from fighting to condone those debts to the fight to access public services which are not mediated in order to access uh, from a financial point of view. So one first step then is to denaturalize this financial mediation in order to access uh, the reproduction, so the social reproduction. Bueno, ah, Verónica, quiero... Creo que levantó la mano Raquel. Raquel raised her hand. Because I wanted to go, to keep going with a little with what Lucy was uh, talking about, because there's also 
the contradictions, the ambivalence of the process that we're descri describing. On the one hand, the new occupations, uh, the, the taking of lands to take real estate, to take empty real estate, real estate had, isn't being used. It's always been a strategy, an important strategy of, of resistance to the debt and to evictions with the pandemic what's being produced is that a true explosion of new uh, occupations, takeovers of empty lands, of uh, empty real estate, um, especially uh, by people, by groups, by, by persons who have no other capacity, can no longer pay rent that are indebted, uh, that their situation has gotten even worse during the pandemic. And so the reaction here is double. On the one hand, we have, from a point of view, a political point of view, activism point of view, uh, there's a campaign to uh, stop evictions, to stop all evictions, to be able to uh, protect, uh, make uh, measures, protective measures against evictions so people can continue to live in their homes despite their debt. Uh, so this is a strategy that's very important in the political uh, to uh, give shelter and to uh, be solidarity. Um, and the contradiction is that this each new occupation of empty spaces is a new threat of uh, evictions. So it's a process that doesn't end, that is current, is continually feeding this process. And the markets, on the other hand, the housing markets, immediately when they detect that this process is going on, they widen a offering of rent in sectors, uh, housing sectors, or uh, spaces that have been uh, currently just uh, uh, opened to offer to people that have been evicted with uh, a lot of exploitation. So there's this ambivalence uh, as um, the final is financialization is deepened in the uh, popular sectors, this ambivalence is, is deepening because the new occupation are a form of resistance to indebtedness. They're concrete, uh, but they also are, they can also be submitted to a new logic of exploitation and of indebtedness um, starting uh, from the popular markets. And that's what we're in, uh, what we're trying to understand in a better way. So I would also say that I think it's fundamental. I think it's a part of the political analysis to highlight these ambivalences that have to be do with processes, with this uh, path that we're marking. One of the things that we would find is that you get indebted to avoid eviction. So debt becomes a mechanism. It's a perverse mechanism. It's a solution uh, today that to avoid eviction, but at the same time accumulates debt. And where is this debt uh, taken? This debt is taken in part of this uh, financial architecture with the borders of the illegal and the informal, and that uh, uh, gives legitimacy to violent uh, measures to provides credit in emergency situations. And so this dimension, this intersected uh, dimension, um, uh, the control of territory, the offering of money in an emergency situation, and at the same time, this idea of debt as a, a perverse solution towards the today and now. Uh, and I think this is a fundamental uh, issue. And another thing that has to do with uh, historical conversations, and I think we're at the threshold at the moment, that is the, uh, the proletarization of illegal economies as uh, something that's hyperdynamic, um, the resolution of these situations, of these emergency situations. This makes uh, the materially the forms of violence that appear in the territories are uh, have this ambivalence. They resolve a dilemma of uh, of uh, 
social reproduction, and at the same time, they intensify uh, logics from the government in the territory that are destructive at the same time. And so what I'm listening to, everything we're uh, putting on the collective map, um, how these ambivalences appear and are documented. And I also want to add something else in terms of the feminist perspective. I, Continue, continue to insist on fundamental things. How do you think about the logic of housing or the ha or the logic of escaping domestic violence within a space that isn't simply the uh, construction of uh, transitory shelters? Uh, put the put the challenge of a spatial of a spatial space of a territory. Uh, of not just a place of uh, temporary shelter, uh, uh, temporary hiding, but another space. This you see clearly in how the dynamics are changing politically. Who is ex uh, who is demanding the titles for uh, housing? There's a demand for title from women. Um, and this is done through uh, denouncing concrete violence, uh, gender violence. Uh, doesn't so gender violence doesn't doesn't uh, turn out to be uh, going to a shelter, but rather getting title to a home. And so this uh, force, this power of organization within feminism has the capacity to to talk, to talk about getting title uh, to forms of housing. And I was also asking myself, we could all um, go further in debt, deepening uh, this that you mentioned, Vero, um, the question about titles, uh, housing for housing. It appears in the in your work. It appears in a reading uh, in a feminist reading of uh, debt. Um, uh, the perversity of this notion of titling of, of, of housing property titles, uh, because this is how uh, debt is generated. Uh, and at the same time uh, that you've uh, just suggested, Vero, that there is, there's also, uh, there's an appropriation, there's a taking over of that uh, perversity by women to demand uh, getting the property title within certain conditions within, uh, I wanted to speak about this, perhaps not the entire public, or not everyone understands the situation between debt and title and what we're calling the popular territories, low income uh, territories. I don't know. I just comment on something to give uh, an idea. Uh, there are different processes where exactly as you're saying, there's a dispute on the titling of property. Uh, it's And it's done in conditions that isn't uh, due to debt. The obtaining uh, a title through debt, this attempt of access to homes, it becomes impossible. It, they're the banks themselves who keep that promise of housing. And then they sell those titles, super, super uh, indebted, to these uh, uh, real estate financiers. Um, so there's a, there's a desire to, uh, to affirm property of uh, certain uh, sectors in uh, popular low income neighborhoods where this has been achieved through uh, struggles, through disputing territory and how this obtaining this uh, title, it's not a poison gift. Um, it, we don't want the bank to traffic with those titles of property. Um, and I would add, sorry, who, so only to comment on something I can't hear. Are you speaking, Paula? I am. Are you, can you hear me? Uh, okay, so I think a, a central point is to de debate property, uh, violence of, in, of property has that because 
why? Because sometimes we're battling to get a title to property, to change the story of where women were not property owners, uh, but we keep the, the idea of property that on in and of itself, for the nature of the word itself, has a hi hierarchy. Who has access? How do they get access to that? In and what we really want is a house, a place to live in. And so I think we have to debate property, collective property. It's a very important issue. It's a crucial uh, issue in Brazil and, and especially in this special, uh, type of arc that goes from the dictatorships to our countries within Latin America. The, within the indigenous uh, po populations that continue even today to resist and and uh, resisting the private property uh, notion and the t uh, indigenous territories um, as areas of exclusion, areas of field. And we can find many uh, examples well during the dictatorship this process that you're all describing. The relationship between uh, title and debt, it's a way that the state took over uh, indigenous lands. It was a case in Chile, in the case in 1978, with the southern uh, territories, the Mapuche territories. Uh, but I also agree with you. It is, uh, the question is also this notion of, of property. And also to end, there's some tricks in there. There's some uh, some pitfalls. Uh, the idea of producing new units of living so that women can, that people can access to housing, uh, destroys those territories. It's part of the the threat to change a popular territory for something new, where they'll depend on uh, indebtedness uh, for, of the family so that they can access. So there's a trick that politic, politics seems to be answering the, the need, but at the same time, what they do is they accumulate a debt that's difficult to, to pay, or you have to have money to pay for things. Now with pandemic, it's even harder. And the other trick, the other pitfall is that, that Raquel spoke, uh, Popular territories have a lot of money that are in the informal markets. There's a strategy to uh, take that money from the popular territories and uh, put it in towards debts that are in the banks. And this money, and I think uh, the resistance uh, towards indebtedness that is, is to keep the money within the community. Uh, it's not just property, but the resources of property can be shared because we're seeing in Brazil, oh, okay, you don't want private property, we'll rent for you. So we're going to have a, polit a policy of renting, here's subsidies in a very wide way, but we'll have to be paid with your own resources and also, um, construction of new homes that are based on uh, getting indebted by renting that pay that uh, that sucks that 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 it's not static oh it flows oh it, uh, it's the flow towards new business of capital business there's also indebtedness uh, for uh, improvements at the home, there's getting titles, uh, businesses of, uh, of social impact to do to do uh, a, a new bathroom to improve the house. You can take a, a, a loan out from a private a person that sells it towards the financier and then the beneficiaries of that improvement are maintaining the flow of capital. There's a lot of money because pe poor people pay for to make their money. Once they've been evicted, they do it again and again. So there are many pitfalls in, in this. And I think the debt is very central to, con to talk about this and the relationships, the, re the resources. 
Lucy, you wanted to say something? No, 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 it's, it's done, it's done. Um, no, it's, don't, don't keep us in intrigue. <laughs> don't, don't make us, uh, leave us with the question. There's a couple of questions from the public. Um, I didn't want to break the flow. Um, if Larissa or Isadora would wanted to uh, talk, intervene, um, I'm going to, for a question of time, one of the questions has come up. It's a question by Alfonso Fierro. I wanted to ask how you see the model uh, of uh, debt and housing in countries like Brazil and Mexico. Okay, let me see. Um, sorry, the question is, uh, there's a, two questions in the question and answer. Uh, and that the first one is in English, so I'm going to translate the Alfonso Fierro one I didn't finish. Um, I wanted to ask how you see the model of debt and housing of the well-being, uh, the state of well-being in countries such as Brazil and Mexico that uh, would um, register uh, inhabitants in modern spaces, housing spaces through credit. Um, at the same time that uh, it, uh, reproduction infrastructure was being um, given, such as schools and uh, childcare and gardens, etc. And um, Natalia is still reading the question by Noma Langa. Um, so she said, how paralyzed can women at home uh, are up against uh, all odds in the space called home? Um, so both questions have been poised to have been given to the panel. I don't know if somebody wants to talk about the model of debt and housing uh, in uh, the states of well-being, or I guess social services, I believe, we have never had in Latin America, we have never had a state of well-being in Latin America, a full social services or human services. It's a model of debt and, and housing. It's a history of construction without urbanization, without without a territoriality. territoriality. Uh, this has been uh, the experience, the concrete experience. The, the historic housing policies, I think uh, we're talking in particular about Mexico during the uh, 40s and 50s, there were projects, there were housing projects there. One could say that I agree in the military states, uh, but the, there was some level of infrastructure, some level of uh, human resources, humans uh, going to school, to the uh, preschool or caretaker. It was part of the uh, packet of credit that was given uh, through a credit, which absolutely has never been true for the housing politics in Brazil and in the most part of Latin America. And even in Mexico, I don't know. I don't think it's been done to scale. It's been done in a large part, these projects, but there's always uh, have uh, remained in the imaginary sense. The, the massive production of homes with a, a, a well-being social, it's in the imaginary. It's historically, it's been captured in the housing policies in a dialogue between the in, uh, the construction uh, industry and the finance industry. And it's always been uh, a, a political merchandise of the highest order because of the need and the importance of housing to, for families. But effectively, the history is much more marked by a history of of self the self production of uh, housing where and I think 
it's very important because of the feminist uh, issue. Historically, historically, the leadership of the movements uh, for housing have been feminine. The leaders for housing movements have been female. Um, historically, there's been a presence, a very deep presence, a very great presence of women uh, in terms of the links with home, women and children and the links to the house, the existence of a, of a story where women uh, establish this uh, link, this responsibility, this great responsibility in terms of housing. There's a phrase that Veronica and Lucy wrote in a, a, fem a feminist lecture of a reading of uh, the debt. How do you do sabotage against finances? And, and I was asking perhaps if maybe you would like to speak about the work that you've been doing in, in uh, 31 and 31 Bs um, or other interventions you've worked upon. Um, you give a series of examples, um, mainly in America, in Latin America, and also in Mexico. But I wanted to see if you wanted to uh, answer that question that you yourselves make. How do you do a strike and and sabotage against finances or financiers? Um, I don't have the answer for that. Uh, um, yes, we're doing uh, a work together with the... Yeah, Lucy, you always have the answers. There's something going on with my sound. Hello, hello, hello. hello, hello. Uh, a moment, please. I, I interrupted you. I interrupted you. And that's why there was an echo, just to say that you always have the answers. In Visa 31, we, we are working with Nuna Menos in the assembly of um, that was formed from a case of impunity that we denounced, and it was a case of femicide. And it was a little bit of this process that is also part of our research which is the feminist strike to use the feminist strike in order to think every day more in the relation between machista violence and financial relations. So we were more uh, putting more and more at the center the question of housing because as a critic, of the urbanization process that is proposed as a model of a governance of the city of Buenos Aires that is ultra neoliberal and that is applying a model of urbanization in the main neighborhoods and villas of the city with this model of titularization based on debt. And this is when it happened what Paula was talking about this a political challenge that women in a way started to get organized. So these titles wouldn't be given uh, from a, a perspective of a heterosexual hier hierarchy because it was prioritizing women who had children and who lived with their partners. So they started criticizing this type of hierarchy of uh, the pro uh, proper proper property titles. But when that started, we had also the problem that we didn't want either that the titles for being uh, owners of our houses means that we have to assume some debts that really are going to become legal evictions because you are assuming a debt not only for um, a mortgage, but also for services. So here we made a distinction between the processes of evictions from the military dictatorship 
up to now, which uh, before uh, they often were based in an explicit violence, and today they are based or mediated in these legal evictions that are mediated by debt. So we made this distinction and the feminist as assembly started with this criticism uh, uh, to the t titles based on debt. And that became a process that started as a criticism to the way the justice uh, ensures the impunity of femis femis or women, men who commit femicide. And then it ended up being a map of this um, housing crisis and the dynamics within the territory. And we also started questioning that a short while ago, the government of the city approved a clause that uh, links the titles of debt or allow that these titles can be sold fraction and so therefore you can connect the process of ur urbanization with the uh, markets of global financing. So at that point, we started as well uh, having a hierarchy of feminist criticism that started in the polarization of domestic space, gender mandates, etc. But it also became a criticism from the domestic space to the world, from the home to the financial uh, global markets. I can even share with you a map that we were working on. I wanted to share it as a screen. If not, uh, we already sent a link to the map already for the audience. I just wanted to say that in that map, there's not only a process of research uh, based on the idea of uh, giving a concrete body to how these financial groups move and what dynamics organizes the neighborhood, but also the government of the city operates by destroying the political alliances between renters and owners, between immigrants and natives. So this uh, title by debt also implies a lot of political uh, dynamics of division among the many potential alliances of the feminists in the territory. So in that map, we also wanted to not only um, write a diagnosis of what's happening, but also we also wanted to show the feminist spaces that were organized to uh, form a resistance, like a counter geography of the financial groups that is also marked on the territories. And in a way, I was thinking about this political uh, challenge that we have in feminism to criticize these hi hierarchies uh, of um, how do you title properties, uh, as well as uh, also criticizing how private property works. So we ended up um, uh, constructing all of these in a very precise way like the, for example, the tenants union had to go out and intervene in the pandemic. And they explained to us that it was so difficult to do politics when the housing is organized in or associated with your own house. And also, I was also thinking about the pandemic and how it was uh, or there has been a lot of displacement that the, uh, the woman called um, displacement by domestic violence. And it's uh, like a escape of this domestic space when, when there is violence within it. So I wanted to think about how we could serialize that, how we could think about those escapes which are uh, don't appear only because debt accumulates, but there are many other 
trajectories that are escaping this, this, this domestic space when there is violence. I think this is an important point, how during within feminism, uh, the, the escape from the house or the reclaiming of the house was in a way um, supported by feminism in Argentina when we hear heard testimonies of many women who occupy territories in different neighborhoods, they would say, well, I'm escaping uh, a violence situation or a situation where there's so much crowding that it really is impossible to maintain. So the fact that you can enunciate that as a political argument that you are escaping certain spaces I think all of that is related to a historical change because before you didn't have that type of argument as a, a, a very prioritized argument as a political argument in order to justify reclaiming or occupying territory. So I think that we are seeing a change that is very important that it is related to this uh, way of um, political intelligibility that we were talking about. Yes, and we just got a question that is related, which is about amplifying the idea of the domestic territory. As Susana Baluz is making that question, and she says that she would like to listen a little bit more or how these scenarios would be where this would happen in, at the level of po po public politics, as well as at the level of neighborhood or local movements and struggles. Yes, I think this is just uh, like um, emphasizing that social and po um, popular movements and the feminist networks have organized ways of self-management of services of uh, housing in a collective way in Argentina that has taken the name of urban local economies and is a way of stabilizing the, the uh, landscape and establishing uh, ways of uh, self-management self from working uh, ambulatory on the streets and, uh, and also, you know, just stabilizing ways of uh, managing territories in a stable way, not as a the transitory of a protest and is reorganizing a structure and demonstrating that this infrastructure infrastructure is not provided by the state. They are denouncing the dynamics of displacement, but they are also putting a, a forward an argument to reclaim uh, resources from the state and combine them with dynamics of self-management. So the way that these infrastructures as that go from care, from providing a food, from organizing safety in the neighborhood, uh, the um, spreading the uh, violence uh, logics. This is a territory that is appropriating the domestic um, space, but also taking them beyond the domestic space. So we can see how they organize popular, communal, um dining places and um uh, as well as how they discuss politically and urbanization for example in this sense there's been an amplification i think that an example that is very clear during the pandemic and that has come up very clearly is the initiatives of self-management of care like for example solidarity kitchens like points of distributions of masks, which are also points of survival and possibility of generating a performance, but also forms of organization. And a very important part of these movements or these local and neighborhood movements about housing have become very quickly in networks that are local and that are for care. I think that in this sense, from a point of view, from a political point of view, they are actually disputing what a public policy 
is and what it could or should be. They don't substitute, but that's but they say how it should be from a logical logic of protection and care of life. You should organize uh, the day to day under that logic and giving an example that is very clear of a new public policy that is necessary and that is necessary as well to fight for it. And not just this factory of production of housing and debts, but many more public resources to support initiatives like this one of self organization or self territorial organization. All these forms of territorial self management in the case of Brazil and uh, in different ways in, in Latin America have had in the urban zones uh, a very specific area, which is the favela. And they have existed there, these forms. Um, it's not just during the pandemic, it, this is something that it has had a long history in Brazil. And in the, uh, there you intersect as well the racial question or the racial issue. Yes, but beyond the production of these spaces like the favelas, the quebradas, the teleferias, as we say in Brazil, beyond that, in the interior of those spaces, there is a construction of ways of self-management and territoriality because the self-production of spaces, of popular spaces, is a very wide universe where uh, included there are private, private regimes, militarized and oppressive regimes that are also doing mm, territorial management. But beside those, there's also ways of self-organization that are based on care. So there is this tension in the popular territory in this moment. There's a long uh, comment in the chat that Lorena Perez put that's here uh, from Chile. I uh, thank the, this uh, workshop in, uh, in Chile is going through a political crisis, as you may know. Uh, uh, the, the debt has uh, set itself in. It comes from finance, AFPs, uh, the, the private pension funds. Um, she's sharing the situation in Chile. Uh, she's asking how you can access the first workshop you held. Is there material that came from that workshop? And uh, they're on the page, the consortium's page. If you go up the chat, you'll see there's a link. Lorena, you'll find it. If you go up the link to the beginning of the event, uh, you'll see the link. Only to say something about what's going on in Chile, because I think it's key. It's one of the play, uh, countries in Latin America. It's one of the highest uh, per capita indebtedness for, for people. A neoliberal model of uh, for indebtedness that uh, what she's uh, highlighting is the the debt that has a, a political protagonism that's very there with that, uh, they, you owe us a life uh, for that, that. There's a graffiti that became very famous, uh, the uh, debt and life. Uh, there's concrete things to talk about uh, pensions, to talk about the financing of food and, uh, and, and supermarkets. I think this, uh, at, on the Latin American scale, I think it's important to 
make that uh, collective file, this regional collective files, what are the specificities about the policies uh, in each region and what is in, what do we have in common? The other uh, particular factor for Chile is the indebtedness due to education. It's one of those things that we have, how uh, giving a public service is a politic. Uh, if these, uh, if public, uh, if the state doesn't give uh, services uh, such as uh, education, this uh, uh, becoming a financial product, um, it, there's a profound uh, conversation that needs to happen about the democratic condition of these societies where privatization has happened with uh, basic services. Um, We could uh, clearly keep going. I think this is one of many conversations that are being had and many more that we're going to continue to have. And, can, and we hope that this will also generate in other spaces, other contexts, other conversations. I will finish here now. I'm going to interrupt, in fact, um, more than anything else to respect the hard work by our interpreters because um, I forgot uh, to remind folks to speak a little slower. Um, I just remembered. Um, and so I wanted to thank you very much and to Lucy and Veronica, Raquel, Isadora, Paula, Larissa, all of the work that you're doing for uh, to share um, a, a research project that is in process uh, that's underway in this uh, uh, time where everything has to be professional and perfectly crafted and perfectly produced um, to do so in the midst of that uh, and offer this exchange, the agility of thought. Um, I thank everyone who is there that we don't see, but we've been hearing you in your questions and, uh, and well, and that everyone will have within what's possible a good weekend as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Nati, and all of you, all of you, uh, Veronica, Isa, uh, Lucy. Bye, bye, bye.